Good morning everyone and on this rather sad day as we mourn the loss of pretzel. Take a few seconds for pretzel. I wanted to cover um, the continuing build up to the great tank off and we have um, five of the contenders here arranged on the front row and contender number six the Amata on the rear row. Uh, the others, the Merkava is not competing, nor is the Leopard uh, 2A7 Pro, nor the Challenger 2 Tez. Um, and one thing you may have noticed is I haven't really gone into any details as to whose gun is bigger, literally. And we all know that longer guns have an advantage in combat, literally. Um, because the longer guns have uh, higher kinetic energy, uh, properties and they're also longer so they're closer to the enemy that's my theory anyway um, but I'm not one of those believers in going into uh, whose gun is the biggest whose energy penetration is the highest I'm not a war thunderer I'm not a um, uh, person that likes to go oh well my gun has a penetration level of a 1000 uh, rolled homogenous armor equivalent at two miles okay Wow, that's good. Um, that's like me saying, well, if I'm driving um, my ST at 40 mile an hour in a 40 mile an hour and someone driving a one litre Corsa with no insurance, whacked off the head on drugs, drives past at 60 mile an hour, my car is inferior? Is it? Okay. Uh, the reason why I don't go into this stuff and why I don't get bogged down in the details is because actually I don't think it's relevant. Uh, all of these tanks here, unless you are playing an arcade game, have the ability to kill each other at battlefield ranges. Now, why I don't like programs such as War Thunderer and uh, other computer games like that is whilst they're all well and good, um, they are arcades um, most of the time. And these weapons of war here... If you are at battlefield ranges and you hit your enemy first, you will probably kill your enemy first. And what we're seeing is the most recent tank uh, on tank combat um, and the most recent peer-to-peer uh, -peer and military combat kind of means that actually tank warfare as we imagined it is um, not uh, being undertaken in the way that we thought it was. Um, and now let's have a look at... Um, what projectiles these weapons of war are firing and then we'll look at why it's not quite as it seems. So first of all um, we have kinetic energy penetrators these are your armor piercing fin uh, stabilized discarding sabo uh, ammunition or APDP DP DP PDF, which sounds like a ferry company, and um, that relies on kinetic energy to penetrate the enemy's armour. Now, each of these tanks does have different armour properties as standard, and they tend to be heavily armoured over the front frontal arc. Okay, your frontal arc is where they are most heavily armoured, particularly the ZTZ-99, because that is where they are intended to take the hits from enemy tanks particular the Challenger 2 Tez really shows that with the arrangement of the Dorchester. Then you have the uh, good old heat chemical rounds. Now heat works by a chemical explosion reaction molten jet going through the armour and all of these weapons are designed to cause spalling on the inside of the armour uh, firing little bits of the armour uh, little bits of metal, a red hot jet all around the crew compartment, combusting the ammunition, killing the crew. So heat is a chemical form of projectile. Now the idea of heat is that actually um, from a uh, gun barrel, the same gun barrel, you don't need as much um, kinetic energy because you're relying on the chemical impact. The downside to this is uh, increased ranges, the heat shell is less effective than your equivalent kinetic energy penetrator in penetrating on its own accord where it makes up for it is that because of the chemical reactions um, the development of the warheads even a low pressure gun firing at quite long ranges if the warhead is good 
and advanced, it can have the same penetrating effect. So it's kind of a counterbalance as to what you are using and when and which weapon you are firing and at your battlefield ranges. Uh, HE goes without explanation, it's designed for blowing stuff up. You generally wouldn't use that against tanks, but you can use it to destroy remote weapon systems, optics, uh, blow off a track, blow off um, an engine, uh, that kind of stuff. And then last but not least, the British favourite, uh, Hesh, um, which is a squash head munition. It's a bit like heat, but it works from the head of the round, uh, compressing, squashing, um, and then the chemical reaction, blowing off and blowing the back of the armour out. So all of these have different trade-offs. Now, certainly you could say that the 2A6M uh, weapon on the Amata may have uh, less um, KE penetration, uh, than the Leopard 2A7's extended uh, gun barrel, which is better than the uh, shortened barrels of the um, Rheinmetall uh, L44 derived uh, weapon as fitted to the Abrams and to the um, Merkava. But if you notice, the Israelis haven't gone in for extended gun barrels, nor have the Americans. Now, partly that's due to cost, but partly it's due to the fact that they know that at battlefield ranges, you don't need it. So your kinetic energy penetrator, yes, it may have an ability to penetrate um, 1,000 um, uh, equivalent of rolled homogeneous armour, but things have moved on. So a lot of the weapons, the NATO weapons, like the Leopard 2A7, um, were are designed really in the mindset of the Cold War. And that is uh, leopards firing from hold down positions, extended ranges against the Soviet masses who are out of range and get destroyed before they can get in range. Then, unfortunately, uh, little Ian's and his mates came along and they got given Milan's. The Soviets got 85, 84's. The Americans, toes. We then had swing fire, hot missiles and all the rest. And these are the great levelers because they use these heat warheads on missiles and they use them to destroy the tank, achieving overkills against even the best composite armour at battlefield ranges. And then as the armour then develops and you get Chobham armour into Dorchester armour, you get improved composites, you get next generation ex external reactive armour, you get a depleted uranium heavy armour. They then switch the game up again, so you've got the spikes, the irks, the javelins, the enlaws in some modes doing top attack against the tank's weakest top armour. And that's why at battlefield range, it really is up to uh, the side that has the best situational awareness is going to succeed in the tank battle. And that's irrespective of whether you've got the two A7 Pros extended um, barreled, high, high pressure, um, fantastic kinetic energy penetration uh, gun barrel, or whether you've got just a Leclerc. Sidon has also become far more important. There is a video, um, I won't link it, it's fairly graphic, it's of a Russian T90 being hit on the side. It immediately destroys and combusts. It's been hit by a Stugner P warhead in most likelihood. Uh, it's instant destruction for the tank. Uh, uh, the tank crew wouldn't know what hit them. Um, the overkill is just so powerful and that's why these tanks are really, that's part of my tank off armoring scheme is to improve the side armor, improve the protection from the side from anti-tank guided missiles. Because a lot of these tanks are armored from the frontal 30 degree arc and that in modern combat is not proving sufficient. But there's weight constraints, which means that that's all you can do. The next thing is that close combat has become uh, more and more important. So in the very few and very rare um, tank on tank videos that there are from the Ukraine war, it's close engagement. Very close. You've got a Bradley taking out a T90 by taking out the sights using its cannon. It then gets hit by a drone and disabled. The crew run out. Their crew, some of the crew sadly die. Um, this is the reality of war. When you do have a tank fighting another tank, 
uh, like the T72 um, charging the Ukrainian T64, it's close combat. It's not at extended ranges, it's not in a hold down position. It's nasty, it's sharp, and it's the person that has the situational awareness and fires first that gets to kill. Drones have changed the game in terms of their providing reconnaissance and what the Russians really hadn't got up till lately is the situational awareness and that's why they were blundering into ambush after ambush. The next game changer is EFP. Now EFP gives a insurgent, a Taliban a militant, a Hezbollah militant, a Hezbollah terrorist, a, a Hamas terrorist, and the opportunity to kill a heavily armoured tank using an explosively formed penetrator. That's really giving the uh, soldier on the ground the power to take out tanks. And in Ukraine, the biggest killer is artillery and the biggest disabler is mines. I agree with Bad Lieutenant, most of the kills are done by something else and the drone is coming in to finish them off. So really, all of these tanks, and this is why the Malagasy's aren't really going into tank gunnery and who can penetrate what at what um, range, um, because all of these tanks at battlefield range, even the older L44s, um, they have the ability to kill each other pretty effectively on the battlefield. What matters is your tactical awareness. So part of the tank off upgrade is upgrading the digital systems, upgrading the maps, upgrading the radios, upgrading the um, jamming capabilities, upgrading the ability for the commanders to have situational awareness. Now let's look at a typical uh, tank um, battle in Ukraine. So here is my mock-up of Ukraine. Um, this is a T90M uh, Pirov 3. The crew have rested overnight in a deep uh, bunker. They've got up, they've had breakfast, they've um, bombed up their tank with ammunition and they're going to fight the enemy. So this is how it generally has been working. Up until recently when the Russians are now pushing forwards and taking more risks, the T90 or T72 would go behind a forested area, it would raise its gun barrel, a drone would be put in the air, It'd be loaded up with high explosive. Here is the Ukrainian position in a forest about a mile and a half away. The T-90 begins firing. The drone operator goes right 50, the tank corrects, fires again. Drone operator goes left 10, Tank fires again. On target, five rounds, fire for effect. The T-90 fires the five rounds at the Ukrainian position. This goes on for a, a couple of hours until the tank is out of ammunition, at which point the tank turns around, goes back, end of its day's work. The crew go uh, rebomb up the tank, refuel the tank, and that's it. That is how the majority of tank combat in the war on Ukraine has been. The only difference is to this is when the Russians or the Ukrainians have pushed forwards. And what you have tended to find is you've tended to find that outcomes a T-90 from a forested area, outcomes a Ukrainian tank, in this case, will use a leopard from a forested area. Oh dear, they've got no situational awareness. They don't know where each other is. The person who fires first generally gets the kill. It doesn't matter how much armour penetration the T-90 has, as opposed to what the Leopard or the T-64 has. They are at such close ranges, it's immaterial that this can penetrate uh, an extra 600 um, millimetres of uh, rolled homogeneous armour equivalent. Who fires first is winning. The downside of all of this is when the tanks come out of cover, bang, 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 in goes the shells, in goes the drone, or Russian uh, tank crew hit a mine, bang, the tank's disabled. They bail out, off they go, leaving the hatches open, and then you see the drone flying in. So I hope that explains why um, I'm not an adherent to the my gun is bigger than yours theory. Certainly longer guns are useful for some things, but they're not really what I'm focusing on in the great tank off. Take care. Goodbye.